Oi. Okay, we have a quorum, and it is also the time to make a start. Let us invite the officials in. At this meeting, the administration provided two response papers. One, in response to discussion on the 18th of May, that's in paper CB bracket 1877. 14 to 15 bracket 02 and a summary of issues to be followed up that's in paper CB bracket 1877 14 to 15 bracket 03 the administration has also submitted the CSAs the English version has been issued and the Chinese version has been tabled. And the administration has submitted the Chinese marked up copy and all the amendments or CSAs are marked in red for our convenience. Also, We also have some papers on Section 68. The legal advisor has collected some information, and I will give the floor to the legal advisor in a moment. At the appropriate time, if you'd like to speak up, just let me know. Now let us ask the administration to walk us through those two papers. That's 877.02 and 03. Deputy Secretary, are you with us? Are you going to take us through those two papers, please? Chairman, maybe I'd like to take you through those two papers briefly. The two papers can be taken together since they are both on New Section 68. I'd like to say briefly that we are proposing a CSA to stipulate clearly that if the agent is not acting within authorized authority and if this has been disclosed to his client and if the insurer that is the principal can prove this then the agent will not have to take up legal liability this is cast very narrowly and this is established in the common law at the last meeting Members asked whether there were other updating uh, apart from the IIA and also the licensing regime. In para 16, we stated that if it is not related to the setting up of the IIA or licensing of intermediaries, the updating would, in principle, be related to international trends and insurance core principles. We would modernize the relevant requirements. In para 6, we have a table stating that these would include clauses 13, 15, 22 to 23, and 41, etc. I will not go into those in detail. And we have looked at other changes, but they are related to the statutory powers of the IIA and also licensing of intermediaries. As to the legal advisor's paper, let me respond in brief. The legal advisor mentioned the cases. We understand and we agree 
the case has its own background and its actual situation. Say, for example, whether it has apparent authority. These have nothing to do with our amendments um, because apparent authority is uh, quite a wide construction, and whether apparent authority has been relied upon. We just quote this case to confirm that in recent years at the CFA, the judgment has confirmed the common law. In other words, if the agent has no authority to represent the principal, then the transaction between the principal and the client will become void. As for the facts of that case, those have no direct relation relationship with our amendments. The legal advisor mentioned another point, and that is the Corporations Act 2001 of Australia. And under Section 917A, um, certain circumstances are specified as to what conduct will be regarded as apparent authority. We have looked at this, and we believe every place has a different background. In Hong Kong, all agents and insurers have entered into an agency contract with basic requirements in a template, and all insurers have to comply with the basic requirements. They can add to them, but at least they have to uh, comply with those, and the agent's authority is stated. So in Hong Kong, every agent knows the limit of his authority, and therefore we don't think we need to copy the Australian Act. We just have to clarify Section 68 to provide for um, where there is no liability. Let us reiterate, it is a very narrow construction, and uh, the exemption would only apply if all three conditions are satisfied. Legal advisor. Thank you, Chairman. The administration has correctly pointed out that um, in the reply letter dated the 22nd of May, and with regard to the response, since the administration mentioned a case, so I have stated my observations in the letter, and I believe the administration has briefly responded to my observations in that letter. As the administration said, that case law seems not to be very much related to the amendments being proposed. And certainly, this case law has more to do with the nature of relationship between the principal and the agent. But the proposed amendment by the administration has to do with a third party. which is a policy holder. And this person does not have um, the knowledge as to whether the agent has the authority. <coughs> but then this is not the main point in that case law. And uh, para 4 of the letter, as the administration pointed out, We have mentioned the Corporations Act 2001 of Australia, and in that Act of Australia, there is a stipulation as to what conduct of a representative will be regarded as within the scope or outside the scope of authority. I wouldn't want so the government may also uh, 
you know, <clears throat> a big, um, you know, big reference of that in the amendment. I think the government has already responded to that uh, remark. Any further questions? If not, we'll move on to the next part. At the last meeting, uh, there were three papers which were circulated to members. The first one is the uh, administration's uh, response to the uh, outstanding issues, and the papers are 858, and that is the uh, we haven't completed a discussion about the, the, the paper regarding uh, best interests of clients. Mr. Chen Kim Bo, uh, is there anything else that you'd like to follow up on, on paper 858 Bracketry? I think we were halfway through this paper. We were focusing on the scenario where the agent doesn't have the authority and the policyholder has signed the contract. I think last time we were interrupted while we were up to a certain paragraph. Would you like to you know, finish our discussion of that paper, because we haven't finished our discussion yet at the last meeting. Regarding our proposed amendment regarding best interest, and this is starting from page 6 of the uh, paper. The background is that in our amendment in uh, uh, section 89, uh, uh, lay down all the uh, uh, codes, uh, one of which is that the agent must act with integrity and <clears throat> honesty and should act for the best interest of the policyholder. And this uh, proposed code, I think the industry has certain views regarding this proposed code of conduct. They also have the concern as to whether or not this may give rise to litigations. We've gone back and discussed this with the uh, legal experts in the DFJ, and the first point we'd like to make is that uh, from the time of the consultation, we stipulated clearly that uh, anyone who breaches the code would be uh, sanctioned by the I. Uh, I uh, B or I A, we have the advice of the D of J is that if in one provision we do not clearly spell spell out who is the uh, the statutory cause for action, I think our policy objective is that the uh, code. So we, we so we agree therefore that we will add a provision stipulating that where you have a single intermediary who has breached the code of conduct, then other persons cannot just rely on this as a cause for uh, litigation. Again, so we believe that this amendment is has clearly reiterated our policy intention, and it has also responded to the comments made by the industry. The industry also has a second concern, and that is what is meant by acting in the best interest of the clients. And in the ordinance, we have spelled out clearly that if need be, the IIA can. Uh, provide for regulations and mm, guidelines by uh, in the form of subsidiary legislation. There is actually a committee comprising the industry and the three regulators, and I think that committee can continue to explore as to how we can define uh, what is meant by uh, you know best interests. Mr. Chen, the ball. I also like to talk about the 
uh, submission by the concern group of the uh, insurers. Of course, we welcome the amendment that you referred to just now. But regarding best interest, it would be best if you could uh, clearly stipulate that for a licensed agent or broker uh, in uh, executing such regulated activities, uh, uh, it would be best that, 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 you, that, that so long as they can satisfy the uh, reasonable expectation. You say that you don't have an amendment at this stage, but in the guidelines you will promulgate in the future, will you uh, do your best to accommodate for that? Uh, Chairman, I can state categorically that since we have this uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, committee, transition committee, which was set up in January last year, they've already discussed the kind of requirements for uh, <clears throat> regarding best interests. And we've made reference of the relevant legislation in Australia where they have a similar requirement and they also have some detailed rules regarding such requirements for the industry. We will, first of all, uh, continue to discuss this uh, at the committee level, and we can also come up with some examples to help the uh, industry understand what the requirement is. And also in the future, the IIA, when it formulates its rules, this would actually be helpful to the IIA when drafting such guidelines. I'm sure the IIA will consult the trade again when they prepare these guidelines. Mr. Chen Kim Ball. So I think basically we have finished our discussion of this paper, but I would like to go back to the point we didn't have a chance to discuss yet, uh, that disciplinary procedure. Uh, and you mentioned there is an expert panel. The industry is saying that when a major decision is to, uh, is to be made, you would consult the expert panel. The government has promised that it would do that. I raise this point because the between the industry and the appeals committee, uh, they want the industry wants to, uh, to ensure that there is a fair and just system. So we don't know whether or not you can come up with some uh, some measure that can allay the concern of the industry. Prime Secretary, the industry believe that the insurance industry is a very is very professional in nature. And they're worried that uh, you know, the layman may not understand how the industry operates. So, so they hope that there could be some experts that can provide advice, uh, you know, uh, at the at the appeal uh, panel. So, where? Can we ensure that such expert advice could be given to the appeals committee for reference, so to and to help the committee better understand the uh, the situation, and that the industry can have the confidence? I think before going to the appeals committee, it would be best that we don't have to go to the appeals committee. Any response from you, Mr. Permanent Secretary? I think starting from paragraph uh, 10, uh, disciplinary procedure, I think we have reiterated many times that migrating from a, 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 a you know, supervisory system to a licensing regime, what we want to establish is that the public will, will, will have the confidence that this is an impartial uh, you know, uh, you know, procedure. So we insist, therefore, that uh, the decision, the disciplinary decision, should be made by the staff of the IIA, and that uh, members of the industry will not be directly involved. However, as the chairman and Mr. Chen had pointed out, we understand that the industry uh, has told us that there might be complex situations where the IIA staff may not have access to all the information or the. Experience be required experience. So during the consultation period, we already proposed that we set up an expert panel. And this panel 
Uh, the function of this panel is that when the IA believes that they don't have the relevant expertise in house in relation to a particular case to make a disciplinary decision, then it can consult the the views of the expert panel, and the expert panel will be uh, will be represented by members of the industry. So the design of the mechanism is that we hope. We'll be able to obtain uh, professional inputs from the industry, but the decision still uh, <clears throat> is entirely to be made by the staff of the IIA. And these, I must re reiterate once again that the IIA staff may not always be laymen. The IIA may also appoint people with relevant experience uh, to join the authority. And as I said. Uh, there is actually uh, a committee comprising the industry and the three regulators. We understand fully that we have an old system and a new system, and there's a lot of uncertainties giving rise to concern. And the issue of disciplinary sanction is also a major concern for the industry. So the committee certainly can have further discussion on the details regarding these such procedures. As to when, how these procedures are going to be enforced, uh, the IIA will have the responsibility to publish you know, a manual, and I'm sure they will consult the trade before they publish that. Looking at the regulators in Hong Kong and overseas, when they prepare such uh, you know, guidelines, they certainly would uh, consult the industry. So having balanced the views from all the uh, stakeholders, we believe that the present approach is the best approach. Any further questions? I understand uh, we've now come to this stage, and you've stated clearly that whether it's the question of best interests, or whether uh, we have, before we go to the appeal, or before a decision is made, there's still a lot of room for for negotiation, because you already have the expert panel. As to when you will consult the expert panel, we can certainly discuss this question with the IIA. I hope that there could be more, uh, you know, discussion, so that for the guidelines and the procedure, so that we can work out the guidelines and the procedures. The trade simply want to do a good job. We 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 don't want to get, you know, uh, it's not our intention to to to. Uh, to let the uh, culprits, you know, uh, uh, go free. So when you set up that uh, uh, transitional committee, please address the concern of Mr. Chen and uh, and that of the industry. I think our legal advisor would also like to make a point regarding best interests. Regarding best interests, I would like to <coughs> suggest this for members' consideration. And it's, uh, and it's also for the government's consideration as well. According to Section 89 uh, one, uh, there is a description of best interest, which includes two types of intermediaries. The in many of the administration's papers earlier, they've already explained this point, and we also have a paper, A five A bracket O three. The government has uh, described, has said that for both types of uh, intermediaries, uh, they will be separated. I think that there will be separate requirements as to what they need to do before they can uh, protect the best, in, uh, protect the so-called be the best interests. Uh, simply put, there could there can be two sets of, uh, you know, uh, uh, requirements for the two types of intermediaries, especially for insurance agents. Is it still possible that we call this best interest? Because the role of the agent, I think uh, the industry previously has submitted, made submissions to the committee uh, you know, pointing out the difference between the two types of intermediaries. For the insurance agent, his primary duty, and he is also required by law to to uh, to do whatever his principal instructs him to do. So, 
regarding the responsibility of the principal, again, the principal would need to. I think, uh, in respect of the policyholder, when there is a conflict, according to eighty nine bracket one a, the so called uh, acting for the for the best interest of the policyholder. So for an insurance agent, would that still be the best interest? In simple terms, where drafting is concerned, can we have more specific uh, drafting to differentiate the roles of the two categories? Who will take the question? Because it seems the two have different positions. One. Um, is an agent, the other is a broker. Shouldn't you talk about best interests for both separately? Chairman, we understand that point very well. What the legal advisor pointed out was also the concern of the industry. But let us look at para 26 of the paper. We have given an explanation there. We can't state the differences between the two in the ordinance, and um, so that we would have different interpretations of best interests for both. If uh, that's the case, the law would be very complicated. Or, on the other hand, we could be too brief. So, the IIA in future will make the code and the conduct regulation of intermediaries will be provided in detail in that code, and there will be different interpretations of best interests in that code. In other words, the requirements will be different for an agent and a broker. We would talk about different scenarios. Say another company is offering less expensive products than the company you are acting as an agent for, and what will be the conduct required or expected of the agent. After consulting the industry, um, it can tell us about its own operation, and we can include all the scenarios, and the industry can follow the code. In the present ordinance, it states that if there is any court proceeding, the code will be admitted as evidence. Any provisions of the code, if they are related to the legal proceedings, the court must uh, consider whether the code has been complied with. So the provision itself will not be vague, and there will be no question of agents and intermediaries and brokers not knowing what to do, because they will be able to follow a very detailed code of practice. When they do so, if in case there are legal proceedings relating to the compliance of this section, the court must avail itself to the compliance or otherwise of the code. So it's very clear. They can just follow the code, and the code will be drafted after consulting the industry. And then the law plus the code would form very detailed guidelines for the industry. We believe that will be better then making the delineation in section 89 because it would lengthen the law by 8 to 10 pages especially if you are going to include all the differences legal advisor anything else thank you chairman in simple terms the administration has explained in the paper what the agent has to do in order to achieve that standard. But 
in the law, if you write down the best interests, and under the common law, the agent has a duty vis-à-vis -vis his principal. So when he complies with 891A, would he be acting in the best interests of the policyholder? Would it just be second best interests? Because generally speaking, that's the case. And would the present drafting cause confusion? And that is in complying with 891A, and if he has to act in the best interest of the policyholder, but uh, at the same time, under the common law, he is an agent and he has a duty towards his principal. If the two are in conflict, then would he still be acting in the best interest of the policyholder? Would there be a conflict vis-à-vis uh, -vis the law as drafted? Mr. Chen Kin Po, I was going to ask the legal advisor this point. I'd like to ask the legal advisor whether the administration's explanation can take care of what you asked. In other words, the law just states best interest, but in the code, there will be a delineation of the differences. So legal advisor, um, I rely on you. Are you happy with the proposal? If not, the administration should go back and rethink it. The law stipulates best interests, but you are only going to provide for a delineation of differences in the code. Uh, is that 100% safe? Yes. Let me respond first, Chairman. The same statutory requirements are in Singapore as we showed in the table. We agree with the legal advisor that there would be a situation of conflict that the agent has to handle because he has to act in the best interest of his uh, appointing insurance company, but at the same time he also has to act in the best interest of his policyholder, that is his client. What do we mean by best interest? Internationally speaking, that means he has to know what his client wants and needs when the other party takes out insurance and whether it is affordable to him. And in accordance with the need of the client, he would give his advice and complete an insurance contract for the client. To be blunt, when an insurance contract cannot satisfy the need of the client or is not what the client needs, the agent should not go for it just because he wants the business. When this conflict arises, uh, after looking at international literature, where it is stated that such conflicts would have to be told to the policyholder, and if in the end it is found that um, the policy cannot respond to the needs of the client, and then it should not be sold to him. Therefore, we have the view that we can take care of this. And also in the law, uh, as uh, was also mentioned, the company and the agent would have an agency agreement. In the paper, we mentioned that when the agent involves in regulated activities, if those contravene the agency contract, the law will prevail. In other words, the agency agreement, if it is in conflict with the statutory requirements, uh, then that contract will become void. We believe this is operable. Now, why? Do we require the agents to act in the best interests of clients? It is because our basic rationale is in financial service provider and his agents have the responsibility to protect the client's interests. They have an important role to play. 
Mr. James Toe, Chairman. The, the speech is not coming through to the interpreter. Please switch on Mr. Toe's mic. I cannot see a red light. Well, as long as you can hear me. Usually, there should be a red light. Chairman, a question for the legal advisor, and maybe the administration can add. I'm a little baffled uh, after listening to the DS and the LA. Theoretically speaking, the company cannot require its employee to break the law. We have to be very careful about breaking the law, even if it is not the criminal code. What I mean is, under a licensing regime, the law states that the agents have to consider the best interests of the clients. And if, in his view, it is not in the best interests of clients, the policy should not be sold to the person. Moreover, even if the agent tells the client and still the client says he wants the policy, then the agent reports to the company that despite his explanation, the client still wants the policy. And the management of the company should say, no, never, our company cannot do something like that. So there is no question of the company making use of the agency contract to require the agent to sell a contract that is not in the best interest of the client. Therefore, I can't see any conflict. I don't think there is a conflict. The company or the agent must act in the best interest of the client, or else there could be disciplinary sanction, fines, or even revocation of license. So there shouldn't be any um, confusion. This is my understanding. My question is, have I omitted or neglected anything? If uh, my interpretation is not correct, I would have to study the issue again. Yes, in fact, our proposal is exactly what Mr. Toh has understood, so his understanding is correct. Mr. Chen Kin Po, Chairman, why the industry has cried out against this? It is because there have always been two categories of people. An agent can only represent a company. But brokers work within a much broader boundary. If you reduce it to the extreme, the agent sells a policy to the client. And if you act in the best interest of the client, he should look throughout the entire world to find the best policy for the client. But as you know, in the market, if you are the agent of company A, you can only sell the products of company A. and the agents would only sell the products of a company. And it is very different from what brokers do. We are regulated by the agency law on the one hand and other laws on the other. I think it is now very unclear, and you are resorting to this to roughly override the best interest provision in the common law. On the face of it, you seem to be protecting the consumers, but you are hurting the agents. The agents would be in a very precarious position. Is it that he cannot sell anything now because he is only limited to the products of Company A? Perhaps I can further respond. Of course, I fully understand as the uh, a responsible person of the insurance commissioner, we fully understand the the different responsibilities of brokers and agents, and because of that, we are saying we've only provided the principles regarding best interests of clients here. 
regarding detail, the details, as Mr. Chen Kim Paul uh, pointed out. That is uh, what the broker should do in certain scenarios. We can certainly, you know, uh, spell them out in details. For example, my company only offer ten products uh, for sale. At which time you may have to tell your client that the company you represent only has these ten products, of which the one which suit best suits its needs would be this particular one. So these such detailed requirements will be spelled out. We will clearly <clears throat> spell out the requirements for both brokers and agents. If members will go to Annex B and the examples that we've cited. In other countries where they have provisions for best interest of clients, in Australia they only provided for certain key points and procedures. As to how you differentiate between brokers and agents, it's not provided for in the law because you, the law cannot be so lengthy. Uh, you cannot, you know, distinguish between the two. Normally, it will be dealt with in in by by way of the uh, the the guidelines. So the guidelines can clearly differentiate between the brokers and the agents, and also the different responsibilities. But the basic principle of best interest for clients is provided for in the ordinance. The details will then be uh, listed in in the guidelines. Uh, see, thank you. Uh, I I've just entered the the room. I don't know whether my question has been asked earlier. I think there are different ways to define best interest of clients. If the consumer may think that something is of his best interest at a, at a particular time, but having heard somebody else, uh, he may think that, that that you know there's something else that would you know uh, you know meet his best interest. So when there is litigation, he may uh, compare what someone else told him was, you know, uh, for his best interest and what he heard earlier. Then the 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 the, the agent may be trapped. I think the agent may be telling the client at a particular moment that something that is, you know, to his best interest. But and then in which case he will be, you know. Caught because it's very difficult to draw the line to define what is the best interest for the clients. Now, if both parties, you know, uh, you know, enter into a contract or a transaction, the most important thing is that both parties understand what are their rights and responsibilities. So. I say, for example, when I, say, you know, give you such advice, I tell you what are my, you know, rights and uh, responsibilities. Same for the broker. Since you are signing a document, both parties will understand each other's responsibilities. So the responsibility is borne not only by the person selling the product, but the person who is receiving the advice. You cannot say that the salesperson is misleading you. The sales staff. And his relationship, with the relation, his relationship with the with the company, is also should also be uh, defined. Otherwise, there will be a uh, oh, lots of disputes uh, uh, because of such a uh, misunderstanding. <laughs> Let me uh, try to respond again. We've uh, actually considered the point raised by Mr. Yeo. Indeed, uh, there is such a concern, and because of that, in the guideline, we will uh, clearly uh, uh, provide for what the agent and the uh, and the broker must do in order to uh, meet the best interests of the clients. And all these can be provided for in detail in the guidelines. And in paragraph 26, we have explained. That as well, Mr. Yu said that when there is litigation, different people may have different opinion, and then one might confuse the road of the agent and the uh, and the broker. In the new section uh, 93, in paragraph 26, we have explained that if the court believes that the provisions in the code is related to the uh, uh, proceeding, then the court, in coming to a decision, must uh, take into consideration whether or not the agent has abided by the guidelines. 
So there is, so when there is litigation, it wouldn't be the case that there will be no, no guidelines or basis. So what we are saying here is that if there should be legal proceedings, the court will have to go back to the uh, guideline as to what the agent is required to do. So if the agent is fully complied with the guideline, then, then that would be uh, uh, taken into consideration. So the scenario, you know, uh, you know, described by Mr. Yeg will not really, uh, uh, you know, uh, arise. Mr. James Toe, uh, follow up on Mr. Chinkin Paul's question. Now, I think if that's the case, it, it doesn't work, in my opinion. So how should one, uh, you know, interpret your guidelines or understand your guidelines? Let's say if the agent uh, is an employee of AIA, naturally he will be selling AIA products because he doesn't work for another company. So uh, is my understanding correct? Let's say if the AIA products, some of the products are, are, are high, of high risk and others are of low risk, and the client is rather senior age and you sell him uh, highly risky products and you're not acting in his best interest. but. If he sold the client, now if there are other insurance companies, you know, charge a, a smaller a premium or offer some uh, bonus for customers, for policyholders, then, then in this case, uh, if the agent said my the, my company's product is not as good as those from another company, so 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 would he be acting in the best interest of the customer? I also like to chip in here the four words in Chinese: best interests of clients. I think we have precedents, uh, you know, in other legislation. But the point is that when this, when, when any case is taken to the court, the court, the judge will make an objective, you know, uh, consideration. Mr. Chen Kim Bo said, "Well, these are the products which my company sells, but the customer wants other products which my company cannot offer. Then, then I will not be acting for the best interest of my client." If I operate an emporium and the customer asks for something which we don't we have for sale, then I the only thing I can do is to recommend him to buy the product from another company. If uh, if I'm not, uh, you know, I don't have a good attitude, I'll simply tell the customer uh, we don't have such products. I cannot instead recommend something else for the customer uh, because that would be illegal according to the law you cannot you know sell the customer a substitute instead of the item that the customer is asking for i'm sure that the court will be able to interpret what is in the best interest of the clients i fully understand the concerns of the industry so could the bureau do its best to allay the concerns of the industry i think we have a very long discussion on this issue of the best interests of clients, so so the question is, how do we sort of you know deal with this issue, given the the opposite you know uh, views of the bureau and the industry? Well, sometimes it may not be the case that the the the, the agent is selling something, you know, uh, uh, in which is different from what the customer is asking for. But sometimes you cannot compare the products, what is meant by best interest, sometimes the premium may vary. Uh, so there's no yardstick to make an exact measurement. Well, in this case, the way you, you, you know, draft it is really problematic. I'm grateful to the uh, 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 Insurance Commissioner uh, for, cons for your, for your concern, but I think the legal advisor pointed out a very important point, and I, and she has said this several times already. 
the focus here is that even though you draft the bill, the amendments in this manner and you refer to the considerations made by the court, you cannot avoid the issue. That is, uh, the best interest of client is most important. Uh, the, the court may not even consider the, the codes or the guidelines. I just, I'm just asking for clarity. I'm, I'm not trying to cause trouble for you. So I think we need to really work this out. All right, I will give an overall response. I think Mr. James To uh, gave a very good example, which touches exactly on this point. Mr. To was saying that the client indicated to the agent that he doesn't want to show the a high uh, level of investment risk. Then he doesn't want to show the any uh, risk arising from investment. Then he certainly you cannot sell him the product which is of an investment nature, but you can sell him something which is equivalent to a savings uh, plan. If it is a savings plan. Then the next question is which uh, which uh, product is 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 the best because uh, the fixed or variable rate of return offered by different insurance companies may vary. Perhaps I can use a simple example. Let's say even for for example, uh, you know, uh, uh, travel insurance. Uh, uh, is it the case that the company offering a cheaper premium would, 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 would be in my best interest? That may not be so because the scope of protection may also vary. But if the agent can only you know, be the agent for the certain products, then in the code uh, we will say that if you are an agent, then you will consider the, the protection that the customer wants and then you will find the best product that will suit his needs. If these are the products that the agent can sell, of course he cannot recommend the product of another company because that would be against his code of conduct uh, as an agent. He would need to tell the client that he represents these few the, the, uh, insurance companies and sell the products of these companies. He can only recommend such products to the clients which best suits his needs. But it doesn't mean that these are the only products available in the market. But what he can do is to simply recommend such products. So in the code, we can clearly spell out the steps that the broker can do, you know, subject to such constraints. And we can spell them out very clearly as to what the agent can do. Such detailed requirements in the law uh, um, is difficult to be so detailed uh, uh, to provide for, for, for these requirements in detail in the legislation. So, and th it is exactly because we've taken this into consideration and we believe we've, we've just, you know, uh, provided for the principle in the ordinance and then the details are, uh, you, know, uh, you know, laid down in, in the guidelines. In section 93, we stipulate clearly that according to this uh, 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 ordinance, in any legal proceeding, the court must accept the code of conduct as evidence. And when there are any issues arising from such legal proceedings, the court must consider whether or not the code, the the, the, the the provisions in the code of conduct has been complied with, although we say we put down the term best interest of clients, but the, the scope is not so wide that it is subject to any interpretation, because it will be subject to the detailed requirements as laid down in the code of conduct. So we've looked at this together with the DFJ, and we believe that drafting it in this way is actually more favourable to the brokers and the agents, because in the uh, uh, code or the guideline, we can spell out clearly what the agents or brokers n need to do. So when we consult you, uh, members regarding the, the, the code, then we can, you know, take on board the views of the uh, industry, uh, and it's much preferable than, you know, uh, prescribing all these detailed requirements in the law because it's simply not possible. Well, I think we have digressed a little bit in our discussion. 
we are coming back to the topic of best interest of clients. Normally, the questions raised by our legal advisor is, I think, I think the point is that uh, brokers and agents are to, uh, uh, are two separate different roles. If we subject both categories to the same best interest construction, uh, there may be a conflict. Let us not digress any more. Let us come back to the point raised by the legal advisor. In other words, the people have different identities. Well, I was responding to this point. We said that we would provide for this in the code. Well, at the end, you came back uh, to this point, and I support that. Don't digress too much. Mr. James To, sorry, Chairman, I should attend all four meetings in session. I'd just like to ask this question. At the last meeting, we mentioned the agency law and changes to it. Is it that in this meeting we are not going to touch upon that? Is that right? Because we don't have a paper on that. We already responded to it just now. Maybe you missed it. Could the Bureau um, briefly recount? We had already completed even the clause-by-clause -clause examination. No, Chairman. What is it now? We are still in the same meeting. Did anyone mention it? We had a paper to explain Section 68 that, in fact, the exemption of liability for the principal would be kept very narrow. Are you going to move a CSA? Yes. Well, no. We need to have a detailed discussion. No, when we come to CSAs, we can have a detailed discussion. No. What I mean is the implications of that CSA. You mean we can have that discussion when they submit the CSAs? No, the CSAs have been submitted. That is why we have to discuss it. Well, when we come to the CSAs, if we do not agree to the amendments, members can move amendments. You have that authority. No, Chairman. We have to discuss whether the CSAs reflect the policy. Okay, when we come to the CSAs, we can do that. We are not there yet. But the chairman said we are already at the CSAs. Well, we haven't come to the CSAs. Chairman, you scared the daylight out of me. You said we already discussed it because it's an important point. No, we haven't looked at the CSAs. We had wanted to start with the CSAs, but then we haven't come to that yet. Sorry. Is it that uh, this paper would be discussed today? Yes, today. But uh, some time has been taken up. Because I have other meetings, uh, there is another one on private columbarium. Okay, any other questions? Chen Kin Po, Chairman. As the IA explained, uh, the DOJ says this is okay. By writing it like this, there can be a balance struck. Can the legal advisor advise whether this indeed is the case? Legal advisor, do you agree to the DOJ's view? Do you think this can reassure the industry because there is clear or clarity in the law? Yes, Chairman. Number one, the administration stated in a paper that best interests would be construed in the code. That is all right because the court will look at the code to see whether there is compliance with 891A. I agree with the administration. Number two, I'd like to confirm something, and this is also for members' knowledge. Under 891A, as drafted, I said there could be a possible in conflict between 
responsibility towards the principal and also uh, the best interest for a policy holder. Maybe the administration can confirm this. 891A as drafted. If indeed that conflict ensues, then it seems that the present drafting will require the agent to act in the best interest of the policyholder first. It seems this is also the intent of the legislation. Uh, this is really what members should know. And uh, this has been mentioned by Mr. Chan as well. There are brokers and agents. And the administration said there will be two sets of guidelines for the two categories of intermediaries. And the specific conditions may differ as a result. And if in 891A we only provide for best interest, now is that ac acceptable? This is for members' consideration. The drafting may not be ideal, but if in the code there is already separation, then members can consider whether it is acceptable to you. Are you clear? Yes. The first two points are clear, but not the third one. Your second point is that according to agency law, you have to be responsible to the insurer, but in the law now you change it to the best interest of the policyholder. We understand this, and for the sake of balance, the administration said there would be guidelines and there would not be imbalance. And you say this is all right. So um, actually, we're not happy with the approach. However, if there are remedial measures, then it's all right. However, I fail to understand the third point. I don't know what you were talking about. Can you say again what you said as the third point? In 891A, there is no delineation. It only says an intermediary has to comply with 891A. But then you also said, uh, as stated in para 26, the court would have to make reference to this and that. And so the consequence is that the code will balance off the best interest provision. That is the objective, right? No. The status will never be the same because 891A is the law. But operationally, the code will be given a higher status. Is that right? When the court considers whether there is compliance with 891A, and if in the code the causes of action are provided for, then under 93 bracket 7, the court will have to make reference to the actual conditions in the code in order to decide whether 891A is complied with. This is how the law will operate, as explained by the administration many times. My question for members is, since there are two sets of rules, because there are two different categories of categories, because they would do different things. So do you still want to express the responsibilities by just using one term, best interest? Now I understand what you mean. You don't like the amendments done in a piecemeal manner. I agree with you, legal advisor. Now should we make our own amendments? Administration, you still have time. As you know, there is a barrister representing the industry saying that you should not go for such a simple way to deal with such a complicated matter. Chairman, let me respond briefly. Whether this is the correct way to express it, if you look at other places and similar laws, if they also express the responsibilities between brokers and agents, they would only mention the principles of conduct like those in Singapore and Australia. They only include the term best interest in the law. The rest 
will be provided for in the codes. Therefore, since we already have section 93, there wouldn't be any confusion as to how the law will be enforced. We believe this expression would only include the principles of conduct. I don't think there is a reason for me to write the best interests of agents, the best interests uh, of policyholders, etc. Because that will be even more difficult. We believe the present construction is adequate because there will be a lot of other things that will be regulated. Mr. James Toe? Oh, he's not in the room. Mr. Yu Siwing? Thank you, Chairman. It was explained um, that even with the taking out of travel insurance, uh, the best interest should be considered. However, this is still very worrying. Sometimes policy holders only look at the dollar amount. They don't look at the content of the policy. There was this accident in Egypt within the tour group. Some people did not take out any insurance for riding on a hot balloon. And then some of those who did not have the insurance were involved in the accident. And then they would go to the court to say, in fact, the insurance policy did not include a ride on a hot air balloon. So you did not consider my best interest, but only my second best interest. The insurer or the agent might then have to face legal proceedings. Of course, in the end, it was resolved, and the insurer gave the compensation. Which company? The insurer. The insurer. You mean they did not take out the policy, and yet the insurer compensated the clients? Well, we call this a special and uh, a, a, a case of a large scale. So the insurer would take up responsibility even if it is a gray area. A policy was taken out, but then it is not clearly stated whether a ride on a hot air balloon would be included, and uh, we call this gray area. So a policy was taken out. It is just that the clauses did not spell this out, and the agent did not say there has to be loading before activities would be included. Well, let's put it this way, Chairman. Some travel agencies would sell packages for other agencies, and then well, this this is really about um, the relationship between travel agencies. Well, no, maybe they will sell packages for five travel agencies. No, I think you should go to another panel to talk about this. No, no, no. If we look at best interests, the thing is the travel agencies should work in the best interests for the clients. No, we are talking about the best interests of policyholders. No, that's quite separate, said the chairman. Some travel agencies also act as um, agents, insurance agents with limited authority. I think uh, the point is whether they know the exact itinerary and also the needs of the client before a policy is proposed. In that case, it depends whether uh, they know the itinerary includes uh, diving or hot air balloon riding, and it depends whether the policy proposed includes this. And I think this can be caught by the best interest provision. No, it is not the travel agency that should be responsible. Well, it, I know that case very well. The travel agency is also the agent. As the agency, 
you must be clear what you are selling and whether it is appropriate. You will have to explain clearly what it includes and what it does not include. You must、uh, sell something that is in line with the itinerary. This is what exactly what I mean. In the uh, uh, guidelines、uh, or the code, you can spell out such details and explain clearly what you need to do under such circumstances. It's not possible for us to spell all these details in、uh, out in the ordinance. Well, the association may, you know, be too eager to sell the product without even knowing the needs of the customer, and then when something goes wrong. They don't know,、uh, you know, how to collect the premium, but they do not know how to pay out compensations. Actually, the best interests of customers and the penalties are the two major issues surrounding this、uh, bill. And to resolve the problem regarding best interests of the clients, I don't think we can really, you know. Result, you know, even if we,、uh, you know, go on with our with, with our arguments, we cannot resolve the issue. And、uh, insurance brokers and insurance agents have always, you know, you know,、uh, have always been two separate roles. And if you, you know, and if both of them have to, you know,、uh, the definition of best interest of client, you know, applies to them both. And you say you will provide for the details in the in in the code, but then you're not able to give us the you know the code now. At least you should you know, yeah. At least let the industry show the industry you know what the code is. But you don't have the code yet. Yeah, you will need to for the IA to be you know established first. And、uh, but you don't you don't have the code code、uh, yet. You just ask. You're just asking me to trust you. Does it mean that I have to give you my 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 trust? You know, right at the beginning. So how would you respond to that? I think whether we're talking about the brokers or the agents,、uh, you may think that we have many insurance products, and that's why the insurance industry is so you know、uh, vibrant. But then these people have to shoulder serious responsibility, and then、uh, and people will only buy the products if、uh, they promise that they would actually bear the responsibility. So I think you have to respect the feelings. Otherwise,、uh, I mean, people will still be you know ask, asking how we're going to deal with this question of best interest of clients. Chairman, well, because IA has yet to be established, and therefore we 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 cannot. I think all the guidelines and the codes will can only be、uh, you know、uh, drafted after the IA has been established. So the part concerning the intermediaries will not be come into force yet. We'll wait until the IA has consulted the industry, and after the industry has given the IA its inputs, only then can the IIA,、uh, you know, uh, you know, you know,、uh, you know. Take that step. So it's not for the IA to decide. They have to talk to the industry. So I believe. But chairman, this is rather complicated. You say that before a consensus is arrived or、uh, upon, you say the part concerning the individuals will not come into effect. You say you'll wait until you have come to an agreement with the industry before you will pronounce the 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 code. But regarding the board of the IA, again we have been demanding that there should be representatives from the industry sitting on that board. But you may, but we're worried that you may appoint people who are accountants and those are not at the front line、uh, to 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 be appointed to the board. So the so-called representatives of the industry, can you ensure that uh, uh, those who are genuinely working at the front line will be consulted? If you gave us that undertaking, then it's different. If you told us that you must consult, 
all these different associations and you must have the agreement before you would uh, finalize on the code. That would be more fair, fairer to every, all, all, all the stakeholders. If you cannot give us that undertaking, then we simply cannot give you our, our, our confidence. I think the paper said clearly that in the ordinance we stipulate there are two types of intermediaries. The agents must uh, be authorized by the insurer before he he obtains a license. And we uh, prescribe that uh, an uh, agent can only represent four insurers. So according to the law, uh, the role between the broker and the agent will not be confused. Our requirement is that the intermediary must act in the best interest of clients, meaning that for an agent, uh, un given the authorities uh, entrusted uh, given to him by the insurer, and act he must act in the best interest of the client. We said earlier that there could be even better products available in the market and the agent should introduce them to clients. There is no question for the client, for the agent to do that because it's not within his authority. He can, he, if he represents four companies and he can only, you know, sell the products of those four companies. Regarding the code, I reiterate again, as I said earlier, that starting from January 1st, we've already set up a transition uh, committee representing the representatives of the industry and through the three regulators. And, when, and we've already also obtained uh, information from Australia. They also have the best interest requirement, which applies to the agents. And there are also guidelines in Australia as to how we can in implement this uh, best interest provision. Very often it requires that the agent must sell the most suitable product to the customer. We have obtained such examples from Australia uh, for to consult the industry. And when the IA uh, issues the, uh, the, the code, uh, you know, uh, there will also be actual examples. Uh, I can certainly give a copy of that to Mr. Kwok. I think in the, uh, the culture of different jurisdictions are different. You mentioned Singapore and Australia. I don't know whether in other jurisdictions uh, uh, it is very common for them to resort to legal proceedings uh, to deal with arguments over the 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 uh, the, the, uh, the wordings in the law that if in the law he briefly mentioned best interest of clients and if something wrong happens to me as a policy holder then i will go after you you but first person i go after uh, when i you know you know look at the ordinance i may not know that there are guidelines behind the ordinance so in the case of hong kong this may result in a many unnecessary litigation and that may not be uh, I mean, and very often uh, the reputation of the industry may be at stake because of that. So how can you avoid such uh, frivolous, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, litigations which arise simply out of misunderstanding? In future, uh, intermediaries may be sued, you know, without good justification. I think this is exactly what we've explained in paragraph 24 and 25. We understand Mr. Kwok's concern and the concern of the industry as well. And that's why we have agreed that during the consultation, we've said that anyone who, who breaches the code would be subject to disciplinary sanctions. So we're going to move a CSA, a stipulating that for an intermediary, if he breaches his code of conduct, uh, this best interest rule, he will not be. It would. This will not be a cause for uh, uh, you know litigation. So I hope that 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 really you know addressed the concern of uh, the industry. I think uh, we are at a very busy time in this council, and very often.
members are at different meetings at the same time. So, so members are concerned about the scrutiny of this bill. Please, you know, make sure you attend our meetings. Uh, Of course, I understand uh, what the chairman was saying, but sometimes uh, wishful thinking cannot change the reality. Say, so at this same time now, we have three other meetings uh, going on concurrently. So this can't be helped. Uh, we have to deal with that situation. Chairman, my question is this, and I believe this question has been asked several times already. The question is that after I read the government's paper, I still cannot understand. I mean, agents and brokers, the agents, uh, the, the broker rather would be would deal with the policyholder, whereas the agent is acting like an independent consultant. He doesn't represent the policyholder, right? He represents the insurer. Yes. So we are, to put it simply, we are talking about these two roles, which are actually, you know, opposite to each other. I think for the insurer and the policyholder, very often uh, on matters relating to compensation and whether there will be compensation and, and, and whether or not uh, uh, there is coverage, uh, you know, as the, you know, uh, demanded by the policyholder, then the insurance and the client may be, you know, opposite to each other in terms of the interest. Using best interest to describe the legal responsibility of these two intermediaries. I think I understand the concerns of the brokers, but pulling to the paper, clause section 89 stipulates that there won't be a cause for litigation. You say this is not a cause for litigation, but if the policy holder uh, based on the best interests of client's uh, provision sues the, 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 the broker, not, not the broker really, let's say he sues the, the agent, then what's going to happen? I remember that I read it some somewhere in a paper from the government. In Australia, this is how they deal with it. That is, for all the possible scenarios, they've uh, listed all the scenarios and they will uh, provide for the responsibilities of the intermediaries in those scenarios. Then you will allay all those concerns. But if you only say best interest of clients and you enact a piece of legislation, then the concern will always be there, even though it may not be a cause for litigation. So if it's not a cause of litigation, what is it? Say the IIA rule, uh, 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 decides that the, 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 the intermediary should be subject to disciplinary sanction. I think this uh, fact in itself could be a cause for civil litigation. Of course, I'm not just saying that just because you have breached Section 89, that's it. But still, uh, when there is litigation, uh, I don't think the, the court can totally rule, out, rule this out as evidence. So has the government actually talked to the industry that is based on what you're saying in paragraph 24 and 25, can you allay the concerns of the industry? I'm not a petitioner. I'm not looking at, at it from their perspective. I'm only looking at it from the angle of a legislator. I don't know whether or not you've really, uh, you know, addressed the concern the way you drafted. What was the reaction of the tray? Yeah. 
There are a few points. Number one, whether we talk to the industry, we did so many times. Recently, before we issued the paper, we talked to them again. At that time, my understanding was that they accepted the entire set of proposals, Mr. Liang. You asked whether this would become a cause or statutory cause of action, and if people still resort to this and take our legal proceedings, well, then that would take us to 93 bracket 7, where it says if there are legal proceedings, when the court considers the case in point and also best interests, the court must refer to the code and whether the code has been complied with. So the code has a role to play here. That is under 93 bracket 7. So the interpretation will not be plucked from thin air. Mr. Leung, uh, you said and in other places, there would be a very long construction. And I think this is really about 961B. Uh, 961A talks about best interest, and then 961B2, it states the uh, procedures and uh, that knowing the needs of the client, you should give the appropriate advice. But then it is only a kind of um, ballpark construction. It doesn't to differentiate between brokers and agents. That is in the Corporations Act of 2001 of Australia. Just now we cited examples and uh, what they should do in different scenarios. Uh, say when selling life insurance, what can be sold, what you should tell the client so that your responsibility to the principal and the best interests of your client would not come into conflict. And uh, what has to be done will be clearly laid out so um, they can follow it. And, and also what you should do when you sell travel insurance. We can write it like that. And because of 93.7, the court will have to consider the code and whether there is compliance with the code. We must look at it as an entire set of proposals. We should not just look at the term best interests. Even if we cite the laws of other countries, I agree with Mr. Kwok that places are different. But if in the principal ordinance this is already mentioned, then it is interpreted in different places uh, in the different countries. Uh, basing on the state of development of the industry and the culture of that place. We think the present proposal is a more flexible way of doing it. If in the end you should see that some scenarios are not covered in the code and you ask what can be done, well, actually, we can revise the code very easily so intermediaries can follow the code. And this will be better than have things written in the law. This is a uh, the direction of our work before we issued the paper we talked to the uh, Hong Kong Federation of Industries and the Association for Intermediaries we had a meeting at my office after that they expressed that they accepted the present proposal and they said that later on they would formulate the code together with the future IIA. They would make their input so that the code will be comprehensive. I hope we can continue in this spirit of cooperation. Chen Kin Po, I think the legal advisor has pointed out a point, and that is what is the best way of writing it. She said, yes, it's good that you have done so much. But if there is a conflict of interest, but if it is not covered by the code, then the best interest will prevail. And I think Mr. Leong also had a point. The client doesn't need to 
talk about the code, the client will only dwell on best interests. I don't want to waste too much time on this, but I would ask you again to write this uh, in a better way. I think this is the bone of contention, and the legal advisor has repeatedly made the point. Maybe Mr. Alan Leung can uh, study the issue and propose a better way of writing it. Okay, I think members. can revisit the issue when we study the CSAs. If we think the CSAs are not good enough, we can consider moving CSAs ourselves. Even individual members can move CSAs. But whether they would be carried We might have to lobby uh, other members stating the reasons for our CSAs. On this point, and um, that is, what is the best interest of different parties? I think we have had a very lengthy discussion. Could we now go into another paper? Can we now visit the CSAs. Should we start with CSAs now? Sorry, the speaker's not coming through. Sorry. To facilitate future discussion. Well, listening to the commissioner, you are telling me that we still have the term best interest, but that would apply to brokers and agents. And then it would mean different things when it is applied on different people. And then the code of conduct will express the different constructions of best interest. Is my understanding correct? DS or Commissioner? Yes. Uh, please do not only nod, please speak up. Yes, your understanding is correct. Then I can follow up. Just now, the commissioner asked me to look at 93.7. 93.7 states that in any proceedings under this ordinance before a court, a code of conduct is admissible in evidence. I also looked at the English. In English, it is said that it is admissible in evidence. Okay, so it's admissible. In other words, and then you also have and. If a provision in the code appears to the court to be relevant to a question arising in the proceedings, the court must, in determining the question, take into account any compliance or non-compliance of the provision. I'd like to ask a question here. Say if the IIA has already made a judgment on whether the code of conduct has been complied with and has come up with disciplinary sanctions, then that judgment would be very in, very influential on the court. Is that the policy concept? Yes, correct. Uh, Chairman, that is correct. Because the court must uh, take into account the compliance or non-compliance of the provision. Okay, if that's the case, Chairman, then uh, your paper said that this would not bring about a new and independent statutory course of action. I'd like to ask uh, about the logic here. I need to think about this more, but as I heard from the commissioner, this is called uh, best interest, but then there would be two separate sets, and these would be formulated in the code. You might have contravened the code 
but that would not constitute a new statutory course of action. However, when the court attends to a question arising from the ordinance, it can accept the code as evidence and it must take into account the decision or judgment of the IIA as to whether there is compliance or non-compliance. Are you saying that if the IIA has made a decision that a certain broker or a certain agent has contravened the code of conduct, then would it be for the agent or broker who has been judged to have contravened the code to submit evidence in order to allow the court to accept that even though he has been judged by the IIA to have contravened the code, however, he still doesn't need to be responsible to the policy holder. Is there this implied meaning that he has to provide the proof? Well, Chairman, both parties can do it, say, if it is judged that uh, he has breached the code or he has not breached the code. Now, if he hasn't breached the code, if the intermediary was brought to court, he could submit this to the court that IIA has investigated into the case and I was found not to be in breach of the code. But on the other hand, if IIA has judged that he is in breach of the code, and the other party in litigation says he has been misled, and the IAA has indeed judged that he is in breach of the code. That can be done. So both parties can cite the judgment or decision of the IIA as evidence. And the court must consider this. My question is for the legal advisor, Chairman. Legal advisor, you have been reading this draft amendment bill. I'd like to ask you whether the burden of proof will be shifted from the plaintiff to the defendant. Uh, this may be the policy holder, or as the commissioner said, it could be the broker or an intermediary. Is that a possibility? Legal advisor. Thank you, Chairman. From what I see in 93 bracket 7 bracket B, I cannot see the shifting of the burden of proof. And also, I think the administration has submitted a paper to explain this in response to an earlier question asked by Mr. Leong. Can you cite the paper number for us? I have uh, that uh, impression, but I can't remember the paper number. Chairman. Yes, Mr. James Toe. For the time being, <coughs> I feel that the wording as drafted, and you say the code would be admissible as evidence. Well, I agree that for the time being, this is the best way to go about it. Okay, <coughs> we can go into the next section of the meeting. Uh, I'm sure we cannot deal with all the CSAs today, but let us just start with the CSAs. May I refer you to paper 877, bracket 04, Annex A. Eight seventy seven bracket O four Annex A. I think you should have received copies in both black and red. The red um, wording is uh, the amendments, so it's easy for you to read. Yeah, I won't go in the 
Chinese marked up version, you have the bracket A, 1, T, and the letter 2, etc. And what they mean is that at the back there is a schedule, or Annex rather, Annex B. Uh, and the, this is actually uh, mm, to facilitate our scrutiny of the bill. So whenever you see the letter one or the symbol or the uh, or the letter or the number at the front, then there is a table at the back listing. Uh, you know the areas where those provisions have. Uh, appear before, so we can easily identify which were the uh, sections which had been, uh, 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 you know, subject to amendment. Uh, chairman, as I, as the chairman said, basically I will follow Annex A and uh, go through the document with members. In Annex A, uh, the marked up uh, uh, portion is in red. And and they would, and, if, and members may also make reference of Annex B, where all the amendments are expressed in a tabular form, and we also explain the the, the rationale for those amendments. So to start, I like to go to Annex A to the left hand side. There is a square bracket with the letter one, the number one, and here. We've uh, deleted the the uh, definition of controller. The reason for deleting uh, the definition of controller is because in the original insurance ordinance and in the bill, under the bill in different areas, we've used the term controller. In different areas, there might be differences in the definition of controller. Early on, the legal advisor raised one question. That is for intermediaries. In part, the term controller is used in parts 10 and 11. Uh, are, uh, are they defined in the same way? Having uh, so, in response to the to that query, we've made an amendment for the term controller, and the main interpretation is. Uh, listed in uh, section nine, which I will uh, come to in a while. So, it, where the definition uh, b b differ from that of uh, section nine, we we will mark it up. Uh, so this is what it means. That is, the definition controller in the old ordinance is now uh, transplanted to to nine, section nine. James Stowe. Do we have a marked up copy? Yes, yes. Would that be Annex A? Annex A doesn't seem to be the paper. It's 877. Do you have paper 877? So Annex A would, it would be the marked up copy. We're looking at page three and page four of uh, Annex A, and then in Annex A on the right hand side, top right hand corner, where you find the letter four, we've marked the the, the, the letter T there. T all all along represents minor textual amendment, which doesn't affect the original meaning of the uh, of the the provision. So bracket four. Where we have the letter one. So is it the case that we now, now, now you have deleted, uh, except for uh, parts ten and eleven. Does it mean that parts ten and eleven don't apply, or are you saying that in section nine we will come back to parts ten and eleven again? No, I think there are many provisions which. Are affected by this amendment, and that's why we marked it up in the here. And when we come to uh, uh, section nine, I'll come back to it again. So, do you mean that the reference is different, or, or is there any substantive difference? So, there is no substantive difference. It, it, it's just a matter of drafting. Uh, 
I think if you put it this way, I, then I have more confidence. Please carry on. Next, we come to page six. Oh, page four, sorry. The insurer. I think, was it also insurer? Before the amendment. Uh, previously, they have the word person. They've read the Chinese word bohem. Is there any substantive, uh, you know, change here? Why, why the amendment? During the clause by clause scrutiny, we felt that the term person is not clear enough. That's why we've added the word chi uh, bohem in Chinese uh, uh, to, in the amendment. Now, originally, uh, the person uh, is okay because it only refers to one category of person, that is the authorized insurer. Since then, we've looked at it uh, again, and we believe that adding the, the two extra words, bohem, wouldn't take up too much additional space because uh, in English, it's still, it also refers to the insurer. So this is a textual amendment for the purpose of clarity and to make it also more cons uh, consistent with the English version. All right. Next, we come to page six. Uh, here, it's, this is about the definition of, of the financial year, and we've changed the term uh, profit and loss account. What is the rationale for that? What is the difference between Xunyik Biu and Xunyik Zhang? Profit and loss statement and profit and loss account. So what is the reason for the uh, amendment? Thank you. We've actually reviewed the entire insurance uh, company's ordinance, and we found that in CAP 41, Different provisions when they ref uh, they have refer to both uh, you know uh, profit and loss uh, account and profit and loss uh, statement. I think we've asked the uh, insurance commissioner, and and eventually we decided that we should uh, uh, use the term "sinjekjeng," you know, profit and loss account, uh, for the sake of consistency. Well, I don't think that is very accurate, Chairman. Uh, do you mean that in the ordinance there are two terms or descriptions? But through this amendment, you want to standardize the term, right? Is that what, what, what you mean? That's correct. There's no change in the English text except for the Chinese terminologies. In CAP 41, there are two, two expressions used. So that's why we decided to standardize the Chinese version. So in the original ordinance, for the same term in English, there are two translations in Chinese. We are taking the opportunity of this amendment and standardize the Chinese translation into a single one. Yes. Well, I understand now. At the bottom of page six, again, there is a textual amendment. Uh, re reference to 3A bracket A and 3A bracket C. We we are just uh, placing it uh, to, uh, to the to the item it refers to, and then uh, on page eight where you find the number two. This is the definition of uh, a controller. Uh, uh, it had appeared previously. We've moved it to here where you find the the, the letter two. The number two. At the bottom of page eight, in the Chinese version, we've we've added the word all. I have a question, Chairman. On page three, uh, uh, controller is controller a different person from? Uh, Gun Hongyan, 
So we're talking about the chief executives or people who have uh, at least 15 percent of the votes uh, for uh, for an insurer. The uh, responsible persons include the compliance officers. Or you know, uh, controlling officers. I think since you, you, it would it be best that you use the word control in both cases? Have you made reference of other ordinances? Well, controller, the term controller, uh, uh, as my colleague explained, refers to the CEO. Or those who hold fifteen percent or more of the shares of the company, uh, controlling officer is actually uh, provided. For, it's one of the new requirements in the core insurance principles, according to the International Federation of Insurance Regulators. That is, other than the controller, uh, you have people in important positions, including the. Uh, internal audit uh, officer, the compliance uh, supervisor, and so on, and these persons have, uh, you know, uh, a major responsibility for the company. So it is now uh, a new requirement that such persons would need to be approved by the IIA first. These are the persons who play a control function. Uh, it could be a single person or or two persons, you know, exercising the same uh, power. So the persons in possession of such powers will have certain responsibilities. So this is actually in line with the latest re international requirements. Well, I have no questions regarding the content. I understand what it means. What I'm asking is that persons in control functions. Are you referring to the uh, regulations in the International Federations of Insurance uh, Regulators? And whether or not the terms used in Australian allergy restrictions are the same? They, do they use the same term, controller? In the majority of the jurisdictions, they use similar terms. But in the ordinance, we, we will spell out what controller includes and who are the people, un, uh, you know, uh, uh, regarded as, you know, uh, persons in controlling functions. Does would controller be included as, uh, you know, key persons in controlling persons? No, they are different. Now, should someone have to bear a responsibility? You're talking about responsibility at two different levels. Yes. The controller should actually be a more senior person, the CEO. Not just the CEO, shareholders holding 15% or more of the shares of the company. Well, I don't know how to put it. The con I think that could be another term better than controller, someone who will bear the ultimate responsibility. I, I, what I mean is that, well, I think you can bring up this point at the next meeting because it's now time for us to adjourn. We've made a start today. Uh, uh, Regarding the date of our next meeting, it would appear that we need to res we need to reserve two more days, other than the second of June at half past two. On the fifth of June, ten forty-five, and the ninth of June at four thirty p.m., we need to schedule two more meetings, because we've raised many questions today. I don't have the confidence that we can. Uh, report back to the House uh, before the holidays. So according to that arrangement, 
date of our reporting to the House would be the 19th of June. We notice the resumption of second debate, 22nd of June. And the committee stage, uh, I think, deadline for 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 that is the twenty seventh of June, and we hope that the resumption of the second reading review will be the eighth of July. That should be the last sitting. Okay. So this bill's committee has scheduled two more meetings. If we, you know, <clears throat> could expedite our deliberations, we can cancel those two meetings. I don't have strong views on many provisions, but with regard to agency law, I have very strong views. So we have to clarify that. I have seen the lawyer acting on behalf of the Hong Kong FI, and he said it was not the best balance, but I don't know why the administration still went for it. There are different views within the industry. I met the lawyer that you met. Mr. Chen Kin Paul also contacted him many times, and um, Mr. Chen also talked to me. But Mr. Sin Chong Tai of your party, had a very different view from you. Maybe you mis you have misunderstood us. No, it is not a misunderstanding. No, I'm telling you, you have misunderstood. You can take it up with Mr. Sin Chong Kai. No, but unfortunately, he is not here. He is in Singapore attending a meeting. I hope you can communicate with him. No, it's all right. He is not here today, and he has not expressed his view at the meeting. His view was expressed previously before we had a long discussion. I was not privy to your long discussion. No, because this was brought up only in the last meeting. Well, it's time to finish the meeting. No, I'm telling you that uh, we still need to discuss that uh, at length. Okay, we'll have to make the best use of the time available. Thank you.